As usual, we choose a subject that crowds us a little. And uh, to attempt anything that is a complete survey of the field, the time that we have is a bit of audacity, but we will do the best we can. And this evening we want to establish the foundations upon which we hope to build in the series that will develop from tonight. In the first place, our subject is anthropology. And we know that the word is derived basically from the Greek anthropos, meaning man. Now in this case, our subject is a little different from psychology. The name psychology is also derived from the Greek, but in an adaptation that certainly was not in the Greek thinking. Anthropology, however, may be said to develop from, to be based upon, the concepts and hypotheses established by Greek thinkers between 300 and 600 B.C. In all essential principles, we are moving upon the Greek understanding of the nature of man. We have expanded that knowledge tremendously. We have at our disposal instruments of verification unknown to the Greeks. Uh, their research, their contemplation, was essentially a combination of rational and intuitive elements. Uh, they recognized, as we must sometimes also recognize, that reason in itself is an acceptable instrument of science. That nearly all discoveries, that nearly all advancements, have resulted from a foundation set in reason. And these, in turn, expanded, justified by scientific techniques. Thus, we do not need to be afraid of reason. What we need to fear is that we shall wander from the reasonable, and in that way endanger our position. In this particular series, we have added to the term anthropology a defining term, esoteric. I would also like to clear this, as we intend to use the term. The Greeks themselves had the concept that certain parts of knowledge are hidden. This hiddenness does not necessarily mean any deliberate effort to obscure, nor are we to merely take the assumption that certain individuals are private to certain knowledge, which can only be attained uh, by cultivating those individuals in some way. The ancients certainly possessed arts and sciences which were locked within their temples, and which they taught only to qualified students. Qualification in their eyes was not unlike a university entrance examination in our way of thinking. Esoteric, therefore, really conveys a certain neglected possibility in knowledge, something obscure, some part of knowledge that is darkened. This darkness may arise from common neglect, and through a long period of time, ideas which have apparently passed out of fashion without actually being disproven, may pass into a subjective condition, which we may talk, term esoteric, as not immediately and readily available. Things that must be sought for, dug out, or in one way or another uh, found in the ruins or rubbish of our common believing. Wherever the word esoteric is applied to a term of scientific importance, it almost means the equivalent of idealistic. In other words, it takes into consideration 
certain aspects of knowledge, not generally popular, not generally known. And it also points out uh, the need for further exploration of certain archaic or hidden fields. The possibility, therefore, of a larger knowledge about things. A knowledge in which things obvious are extended toward those ends which are not obvious. Or where knowledge readily available is traced back uh, to foundations hidden deep in the mysteries of time. Thus we do not mean to imply supernatural. We do not mean to imply by the term esoteric cultal or pertaining to some private group of opinions. Rather what we wish to do if possible is to restore a larger picture that is generally understood by the principal word anthropology to see if we can discover valuable clues in neglected areas, and most of all, to bring idealism into harmony, if possible, with modern scientific research. Esoteric religions are not those essentially apart from other religions, but are usually phases or divisions within a religion. Uh, uh, divisions of persons more deeply concerned with value, and I think that, again, is part of the meaning of our term, esoteric. From the uh, general definition of this subject, then, we must pass to a broader definition of anthropology itself. What is this field? Anthropology is a science, and is concerned primarily with the origin, development, and social condition of mankind. And that part of anthropology which deals with origin involves many other departments of learning, such as, for instance, for instance, archaeology. That which deals with the development of man also calls upon many forms of knowledge. These forms of knowledge having to do with the various biological processes in nature particularly the, as these apply to man. And finally, the cultural phase of anthropology includes practically everything that contributes to the progress of man. And especially, I think, in its broader sense, the cultural part is deeply indebted to religion. Even the most conservative anthropologist will admit that there has been no single force operate, operating more continuously upon the life of man than his religious convictions. Thus all these subjects have to be brought, brought together, made into a workable, useful, practical combination in, for, in order that we may understand ourselves. And in the understanding of the general orientation, perhaps come to some valid practical uses. When these are discovered, we drift away a little bit from anthropology and finally discover that it leads us inevitably into the full problem of sociology. All of these elements we have to consider together, although we cannot extend any of them uh, to an extreme point without endangering the area of coverage which we hope to attain. Another perhaps simple way of summing up the problem of man uh, is to say that anthropology traces the internal instincts of man from love of food to love of God. Everything that lies between comes more or less in the story of this unfolding human being. To go back then we must now pause for a moment in the field of archaeology and even make a brief uh, detour into geology. At this point, let us also call something to our attention that we probably instinctively know but do not always remember at exactly the right moment. Geology has become a very advanced and specialized subject. And in the course of its development, many brilliant minds 
have attempted to recreate the primordial world. They have given names to the various periods that have been noted, at least by geological fragments or by speculations upon the formations of various uh, strata and so forth of the world. Uh, these names, however, though we have come to use them quite familiarly, are really not names of anything. Uh, we speak, for instance, of the Pleistocene Age. This is not the name for anything. It is a convenient man-made term. And we have to be very careful that we do not mistake words for ideas and become hopelessly bogged down in being contented to memorize uh, the various scales of time and circumstances uh, with which these abstract subjects are burdened, I would feel. Actually, the world, as Galileo said, moves. Everything is in motion continuously. Growth is not a series of sudden steps. Evolution is not climbing from one shelf to another and then pausing for a while. Evolution is motion. Evolution in the case of man is motion against another motion, the motion of nature. Everything moves. Heaven, earth, and man all move. Consequently, it is difficult for us uh, to comprehend all of the circumstances of this motion. And in trying to make it a little more tangible to our thinking, we even go so far as to attempt to assign dates to motion. Uh, these date assignments, as most of us realize, are very tricky and not of long endurance in most cases. Uh, various ancient dates are being continuously changed. Every new degree of development, every new discovery that we make, uh, every new instrument for calculating these problems, each will result in due time in a modification or change in the dating of the world. To attempt a basic date would probably be approaching the ridiculous. We do not know. And all learned speculation in this matter is not knowledge. It is a hoped-for conclusion. It is someone who has achieved sufficient dignity of reputation to put himself out on the end of a limb and hope that he will die before anyone cuts the limb off. He is only affirming to be ultimately refuted but it's quite possible that this reputation will not injure his reputation because he will be gone by that time. Thus it is not within our speculation to attempt to date some of these vast cycles. Anyone who is interested in such dating uh, can consult available texts and will find the information in reasonably condensed form. One point, however, we will note. Namely, that for the last hundred years, there has been a consistent tendency to push dates back. Whereas 50 years ago, we dealt in the terms of 100,000, 500,000, a million years, relating to the origins of certain universal uh, mysteries. We now prefer to think in the terms of a thousand million, or 5,000 million. And by degrees, we get so thin in our thinking on these vast numbers that they are comparatively meaningless to us. We can no longer really conceive their actual meaning. And we doubt if those who use them really can feel or experience anything except a tremendous sense of interval. Beyond that, it is almost impossible to rationalize. The tendency to push back geological date has also been echoed or reflected in the pushing back of anthropological origins. Therefore, uh, we know that we no longer live 
in the world which believed that man was created 4,000 years before the beginning of the Christian era. We can no longer quite accept this. We must begin to recognize that if this statement had a valid meaning, we have missed the meaning completely and have applied it to something for which it was not intended. We have also lost much interest in the 50,000 year old man and the 100,000 year old man. So we now begin to think somewhat in this way, from the standpoint of anthropology, that the process is suitable for the generation of man, for his gradual emergence in nature, and for the process is bringing him up to his present state of uncertain nobility, should be estimated in terms of not less than one and a half billion years. Now that's a long time. H.G. Wells pointed out that it was such a long time that what we call the historic era of man is less than an instant in that time. Now a billion and a half years is, as we say, purely a symbolic dating. Hardly will we get it spoken before someone will change it. But they will not change it for less. They will change it for more. They will say one day, two billion. Then someone will be more certain that it is three billion. One thing we may be reasonably certain, the date will not be shortened. Because the more we experiment into these problems, the more we realize that we have been hasty in assuming too much within the compass of our normal historical thinking. The next point that we should bear in mind is that this process of producing man had to pass through a series of modifications. These modifications we will later examine on several levels, but first I would like to dispose of the prevailing anthropological hypotheses. You are entitled to them, and uh, your thinking should consider them, not eliminate them. We gain nothing in this world by saying, oh, that's not possible, and passing on to something else. Anything that is discarded must be discarded with reason, and anything that is accepted must be accepted with reason and intuition. Otherwise, we shall fail in our essential purpose. T uh, taking the terms generally familiar, we use them also to point out a certain conflict which almost immediately appears and renders some of these terms rather obviously arbitrary. It is assumed that down through this period of one and a half billion years, it took a great length of time to bring man to what might be termed uh, the condition of biological maturity as a species. Now, various guesses have been made as to how long ago this important maturity occurred. The guesses at the present time are running from 500,000 years to about 100,000 years. This does not mean that man prior to that time was not here. It merely means that man prior to that time had a certain psychobiological childhood that up to a certain period man had not attained to the faculty or power which modern anthropologists feel contributed the most to his progress and that was the instinct to culture. The instinct to culture had to arise from something. It had to arise from the attainment of certain previous conditions. And the instinct to culture is regarded as a unique attribute of the genus Homo. This instinct to culture is not to be observed in other kingdoms of nature that we can see. And I might also point out that this has caused a bit of concern in some quarters because it rather de definitely assails 
certain phases of the Darwinian hypothesis. If man is simply the product of nature, a nature which also includes other creatures indubitably older than himself, or which have attained to what might be termed their biological maturity, not ours, but theirs, it rather amazes a certain group of anthropologists why the instinct of culture has appeared only in man if man is part of a common creation. In other words, if all creatures are molded from the same essential, uh, universal essences, substances, principles, how is it that this one element is unique in man? What lies behind this uniqueness? Why is he unique? By what cause or circumstance was this factor or faculty bestowed upon him and withheld from others? And as man has been growing and developing, surrounded by other life in various forms and degrees, for a billion and a half years or more, how is it that rudimentary traces of this cultural instinct are not appearing in other parallel kingdoms in some way. Why is man so unique? We may point out an exception in the ant or the bee. We may feel that certain cultural instincts do appear in these creatures, but study of them still leaves us in a state of general bewilderment or we would scarcely have expected uh, a systematic development of culture in this comparatively limited bracket of evolving life. So the cultural instinct arising in man seems to be derived from some independent source. Otherwise, what we like to think today as common experience would have produced it in other creatures. They were in the same environment. If environment causes all, why did it not rub off on them? If environment is the total cause for our uh, cultural individualization, how is it that other creatures in the same environment did not develop also at least cultural systems suitable to their own kind. This we find not to be the case, nor can we fully explain even now why this differentiation of creatures, some of which unfold in one way and some in another, and still others seem to disappear entirely in the limbo of time. Thus our anthropological background is essentially and obviously weak. There are so many more uh, questions than there are answers that our only available technique uh, to use in the ordinary sense of the word is to follow the idea that we cannot know why but must always interpret why as how. The why we simply do not know. How we are beginning to suspect we can uh, make a few statements about without being entirely ridiculous. The recent findings in connection with this subject also present us with another definite problem. Let us assume for a moment that our anthropologists are somewhere near correct in their assumption that man moved from a survival foundation to a cultural foundation not less than a hundred thousand years ago and probably considerably earlier. If this is the case, why are we so peculiarly and mysteriously devoid of the connecting links which binds what we might term the growth of culture to the flowering of culture. When we study a child, uh, we may have 
some record, either in memory or by the old family photograph album, and we can say this was Willie when he was five, and this was Willie when he was six, and this is the way Willie looked when he had his first uh, uh, summer camp, and this is the way Willie looked when he went to college. We have all of this information. But in the case of man, we do not have this information. We say this is the way Willie looked when he was born. This is the way Willie looked when he was grown up. We have nothing between. When I say we have nothing between, I mean by this nothing that the grown-up Willie begins perhaps five to six thousand years before the beginning of the Christian era in terms of anthropology. Grown-up Willie rises to our attention with Egypt. Uh, with the ancient Indic foundations of culture in the trans uh with the rise of the earliest cultures of China, we perceive a tremendous flowering. We see the builders of the pyramid. We know from the study of their works that they were not merely infants with prodigious strength that they possess knowledge, integrated knowledge, scientific knowledge. This in itself is a very, a very strange and somewhat wonderful circumstance because it represents the attainment of a certain cultural platform. We are perfectly willing, or perhaps a little grudgingly willing, to acknowledge there were some pretty smart people five or six thousand years ago. It is humiliating, but we will ultimately get around to it. That is not so bad. But what about the people 10,000 years ago? We have nothing to link them with the rise of Egypt. We have speculation, yes, but that is all. We do not know the steps that led up to the dawn of historic culture as we know it. We know they must have been there. We know that there has to have been a cause for the effect of power. We know that man did not suddenly step through a curtain from nowhere. But we do have what is called the dark curtain of history. And this dark curtain covers the backstage of a situation that is most intriguing, but about which we are almost totally without knowledge. Thus, we must assume one of several things. First, that in some strange and mysterious way, what we might term culture was quickened at a certain time. And out of an abysmal lack of itself, or debility of itself, there came a sudden and incredible flowering. The next possibility is that there was an unbroken line of historical ascent and cultural ascent behind Egypt, and that for some reason we have not been able to rediscover the remains or evidences thereof. It is intriguing, however, that we should be also uh, so frustrated in many other areas. We might assume that the possibility of the tides and times uh, which have removed so many monuments, sweeping away some, but how do we explain the sweeping away of all? Why is it if we cannot find anything in Egypt, we are no better off in China? Why is it that we cannot move any of these civilizations and cultures back beyond a certain point? If we go behind that point far enough, we pick up culture again. We pick up culture 25,000 years ago. 50,000 years ago. We find evidences of ancient culture in crude drawings on the walls of caves in Spain and France. We find carved bits of bone and broken artifacts that tell us something of the people who lived very long ago. But in between, there is this strange, incredible, inscrutable darkness. And up to now, we have not been able to penetrate it. So we pass over it with a few generalities. Generalities which also are likely to be subject to constant change and modification 
as time goes on. Also on the general field of our subject, we realize that in the clouded wall of what we might term this black curtain of history, this mist that hangs over the origin of everything, the same mist that hangs over the inner life of man, dividing the visible from the invisible, a mist of oblivion rather than of darkness, a mist of, a mist of unknowns and uncertainties, a strange wall of emptiness which is more firm and more solid than any wall that we know in this world, a wall which we strive desperately to break through, only to break ourselves in the attempt. Sometime man will break through, but up to the present time he has not been able to do so. So we now have a parallel phenomenon accompanying this, and that is that right against this curtain, this dark curtain, as though against a motion picture screen, an, an incredible fantasy unfolds. For well, just at the point where history vanishes into the darkness of prehistory stands a tremendous pageantry of shadows which we call myths. Myths and legends. Someone has said that mythology is the history of the prehistoric world. But this rise of a world of legends, legends that are distributed throughout the world, Legends dealing with the sources of things, and also in an intermediate way with other things. Legends that certainly originated long ago, but passed gradually into embodiment in the earliest institutions of history as we know history. Legends of ancient times that perhaps move into embodiment in the heroes and the, and the great uh, persons who must have flourished at a comparatively remote time. Yet never do we find these heroes, these remote persons, either primitive or barbaric, essentially, or different from the cultures uh, which later developed around them. Had these heroes been different, the cultures would have been different because these heroes became the archetypes or the patterns for the development of culture groups. Thus we find, for instance, standing against the background of Greek mystery, standing between the known and the unknown, the rising of great hero cycles, of which a good example is the cyclic myth of Hercules. Now, Hercules was not a primitive being. He was not a neoanthropoid. He was not a creature uh, corresponding with the concept of the Cro-Magnon. He was not that kind of person at all. Hercules was a son of the gods. He was a great person. He was endowed not only with vast physical strength, but also with great skill with wisdom, knowledge of arts and sciences, and he stood out to the Greek world as a truly heroic prototype of the satisfactory Grecian of at least one period in Greek thinking. Who was Hercules? Was Hercules a deified mortal? Was he someone who lived long, long ago, perhaps in that shadowy land between history and prehistory? Was he a complete fabrication arising in the mind of Greece? Was he a dream symbol brought out of the unconscious or subconscious life of the Grecian people? We do not know with certainty the answers to these questions, but we gravely suspect, as psychology also points out, that it is very difficult for an individual to dream a complete fabrication. That he may distort, that he may confuse, that he may bring patterns out of focus and out of harmony with each other. But psychology would be inclined to suspect that man cannot dream totally apart from his own experience.
Therefore, if he could dream of Hercules long, long ago, there had to be something within himself which made the establishment of this archetypal concept possible. Yet at the time when very likely this dream was being uh, brought into expression, we are not in a position to assume that man possessed the environmental circumstances that would have made the Hercules dream possible. This presents another very confusing element of our pattern. So let us divide for the moment our world into the unfolding of history, which is nothing more or less than the story of the unfolding of culture. That behind this is this mysterious middle region between history and prehistory. And there stands the great cycle of the myths from Hesiod, the Vedas, the great teachings and mysteries of Assyria and Chaldea and Babylon, the wonderful legendary lore of China, and even some of the prehistoric myths of our own Western Hemisphere. Then behind the myths we have what looks to be a very prosaic world, a world of very commonplace things, of flint axes, and of long difficult struggles with saber-toothed tigers, and a man struggling for fire, struggling for the domestication of animals, and following one anthropological thinking, uh, working for perhaps several million years to find out that he could make a friend out of a dog. These kind of things were all there. We find him weaving and making rough pottery. We find him uh, gaining such extraordinary self-modesty as to begin to wrap animal skins around his body. Whether for protection, ornamentation, or morality, we do not know. We suspect that it began with protection, passed from there to ornamentation, and only became a problem of morality after he himself became corrupt. This is the way these things have a tendency to develop. So we have a kind of a strange stage on which we have to set our play. If we are not too questioning, we have no problems. The moment we begin to question, we have no answers, but such is life. <laughs> Out of this, we will proceed to the next situation that we are concerned with. Actually, science is not at all certain as to how man came into being. So actually, uh, they depend today very heavily upon the Greek thinking. Now, we have a belief or general feeling that the Greeks were the greatest mythologists of all time, that there was no group of people that could spin more elaborate fantasies than our Grecian forebears. And they point out the such delightful episodes as Zeus turning himself into a white bull and abducting Europa, and things of that kind, and to follow the statement of one small boy studying it, they had the awfulest imaginations. <laughs> Actually, however, the Greeks were very sensible people. And that means that someday their mythology will have to be completely reestimated. They were not the kind of people who were foolishly following any doctrine or belief. Uh, Arthur Murray of the Department of Greek and Roman Antiquities, the British Museum, tells us that in the Greek we have the story of the creation of man. And that perhaps of all peoples, the Greeks were the only ones who said that the development of the species did not begin with a single pair of persons. This is one of their more or less unique contributions. The Greeks, in their own simple natural way, divided uh, this concept to assume that man appeared simultaneously in a number of areas. That man was not merely uh, one generation, but it was a kind of species. 
and even among the Greeks themselves, there are separate, or worse, separate, distinct creation myths for the different provinces of Greece. The Greeks did not feel that they descended entirely from one pair of human beings. They believed that at a very remote time, by various circumstances, man came into existence in many places. Therefore, they assumed that it was scientifically reasonable that uh, human beings were different even from the beginning. That these differences to the Greeks were not qualitative in the sense of one being having greater aptitudes, attributes, or more worthy of honor than another, but simply that they were different. And our early Greek thinkers in this matter were quite ingenious they assumed that these different beings arose in different regions and therefore were immediately exposed to the pressure of regional conditions. Thus, long before they had attained even uh, our anthropological adolescence, uh, those who dwelt or were originating in mountainous areas, were different from those in valleys or by the shores of the sea, persons in tropical regions different from those in frigid regions, and the Greeks had already discovered that climate and location were tremendous forces in the individualization of man. Now they did not attempt to explain all the mysteries thereof, but they took it rather for granted that humanity was a kind of creature, that it appeared in various regions, that these regions became distinctly and definitely associated with the races, tribes, and clans that originated in those regions, and that growth was the natural unfoldment of men in the places where they were, and that the secondary factor of growth was the gradual awareness of other men, and the mingling and bringing together of these different groups under various types of sociological pressure. The Greeks got about that far, and that is as far as they were able to go, with that particular phase of the subject, although this does not exhaust their whole thinking on it by any means. It would not be easy to quickly uh, exhaust the thinking of Hesiod or the thinking of Plato on such problems as this. The Greeks in many regions had their legends and their myths. One of the most common of these, of course, is in share with nearly all others, namely that there were two distinct creations. That there was a creation preceding a kind of universal deluge. That there was then a creation following this deluge that there was somewhere in the ancient form and time of things a race or an order of life of human nature and structure at least capable of those moral delinquencies which we associate peculiarly with humanity and no other creature, by which the wrath of deities uh, came to bring about a deluge or a destruction in punishment for sin, and that this ancient order of life vanished away. The second concept of the Greeks relating to this was the replenishment of man. Not the origin, but the re-origin, re or the secondary appearance of man. And one of the most familiar and common legends relating to this among these people is the story of Deucalion and Pyrrha. Uh, this legend tells uh, that these two, the human survivors of the deluge, consulted an ancient oracle to find out how the earth should be replenished. And the uh, oracle told them to cast behind themselves the bones of their mother and for a long time they were not certain what was meant. 
Then they realized, or are made to realize, that the mother was the earth. Therefore, that the bones of the mother could be rocks. So they each took rocks and cast them back over their shoulders. And these rocks that were cast by the man became men, and those that were cast by the woman became women, and thus the earth was replenished. The Nordic peoples believe that the original human family evolved from ash trees that were most anciently honored, and that a certain kind of tree gradually changed into human beings. Uh, the Phoenicians and other ancient peoples declare that life all began in water. Now this is uh, a very interesting point because this belief was held uh, by these people long before it had any significance whatever in modern thinking. In fact, the modern approach was at least theoretically a complete rediscovery of the hypothesis. We may suspect that someone turned the pages of an old book, but we're not in any position to know just who or when. But this ancient uh, mud or slime, which was the origin of life, was called elus. And uh, from it came the word ilium, which was the ancient name for the city of Troy. This ancient slime, by means of a process of corruption, disintegration taking place within itself, released monocellular or simple organisms. And from these simple organisms there grew gradually by evolution all of the animal, uh, fish, bird, insect, and reptile forms of life. And that these various forms of life gradually unfolding finally resulted in the appearance of man. Now for people thinking this through probably 4,500 to 5,000 years ago, that wasn't so bad. They were, what we would say, on the right track. Or if things should change the course of time, uh, they and we are on the wrong track together. And at least that is the way uh, we think about it at the present time. This brings us again uh, to uh, an effort to estimate uh, what you might term the problem of the origin of our kind. And uh, at this stage, going back to the very shadowy phase of things, we can only say one of two things. Either that we will stick with the modern anthropological findings, uh, which are in substance approximately what I have said, or else we must strive, strive through ancient institutions of learning and through tradition, through legend, and through ancient sacred sources to see if we can enrich this story and by so doing bestow upon it what we would like to term its esoteric overtones. On this basis, then, we go back to the oldest accounts that we have. Accounts that have any tangible cultural significance to us today. I can go out here into the valleys back in California or even not any further than the caves near Santa Barbara and find writings on the walls. Writings of strange and primitive symbols. I've had probably a hundred examples brought in here to have read. People want to know just exactly what those symbols mean. Uh, such symbolic reading cannot be achieved. The most that we can hope to do is to suggest certain psychological reasons why primitive people should make use of certain symbols. Those symbols were devised by them for meanings that lived and died with them. We cannot be again one of them. Consequently, we cannot actually experience what they meant by these symbols, which have no alphabet, which have no formal structure as we know it, are but a small group, and probably are among the earliest pictoglyphic ancestors of hieroglyphs. 
We cannot restore them. But we can realize that someone way back, or maybe not so far back in time, but far back on cultural platforms, devised these to preserve some record or make some mark that others might be able to share with him. That is, uh, that was the beginning of this type of thing. Back in the days, therefore, where we are most interested, we have no records, not even crude markings on the walls of caves. Much earlier, far behind this, no written language, no spoken language that we know. No true evidence or substance upon which to build. We are groping back into the twilight of the pre-dawn of mind as we know it. And we cannot relive it. The only hope that we can accomplish is the instinctive, intuitional restoration of it out of our own unconscious, where it is the only place where it can be locked that we can reach. Whether we can reach it immediately is a grave question, but it will never be found except in man, inasmuch as it is part of that infancy of man, which psychologically can sometime be restored out of the symptoms and symbols that arise in his more advanced state. This is all that we can hope to think through very clearly. Others tried to think this through before we came along. The Egyptians tried to think it through, and they were a little closer to it than we are, although the proximity is probably fractional. They gave us, all together, this wonderful age of fables. They gave us their psychological restoration from the folk or from the subconscious collective. Everything that was possible to conceive to be there. Therefore, we do have, as we find later in Jewish sacred literature, two distinct creations that always parallel. In the Jewish it is the Yavistic and the Eloistic. And in other faiths, it takes similar or parallel structures. And all these cultural origins together, there emerges at the dawn or the beginning of things, the gods. Nothing begins actually below. That is something that is in our subconscious. It is not something we've learned primarily. Even if we had learned it, it would be much like other learning that is long, long gone and forgotten, unless there had been something about it that made us want to remember. And so today, 6,000 years after the rise of Greek myths, we still study them in school, and we are grateful for the great Greek dramatists, like Aeschylus and Sophocles who have given us <coughs> revisions of these ancient stories in the first great theatrical productions of Greek theater. All of this then goes back to one primary concept, that it all began in a strange way with the gods. Now different nations have different gods or different names for gods, but further re research on the la basis of language proves that there is an underlying, submerged, lost language form which bears heavily upon the subject of our concern. That these various names did not actually arise from any language that we know, but from a mother tongue that must have existed back in there. And that this mother tongue, itself evolving at a remote time, broke up into languages which we know. And that the oldest languages we have today are also branches. That the mother tongue, like the mystery of life, is lost and can be found only in other languages, showing through, shining out, through great structural similarities 
of word idea patterns uh, which we are able to restore and use. So we have the rise of this order of gods. This order of gods tells us one thing, that at the time it was devised or developed, man possessed certain intuitive insight. Uh, we have another brief pause, a slight digression only, to point out that in all probabilities the great mythological systems of the gods did not arise like Athena, full-blown and full-armed from the head of Zeus. These myths also had their dawnland, their childhood, their infancy. But some 4,000 years before the beginning of the Christian era, these myths reached their psychological maturity, and nothing important has been added to them since. From that time on, they did not grow. They were only remembered. And others coming after them attempted to release from them meaning beyond the literal by the instrument of interpretation. And this instrument of interpretation has forever been a shifting and changing thing. The gods, then, were the origin of all the various things that man knows or experiences. They lived in a world, at first, unknown as to location. It's a funny thing. You have your evolutionary procedure working here also. Somewhere in the beginning of time, the gods uh, dwelt around the corner. The gods dwelt in the nearest mound. The gods dwelt in the grave of the ancestor. The gods were almost anything, from a little piece of bone with a feather on it, uh, to the most complicated concept. But from primitive people we realize, even now, that the gods of ancient man must have been very near to him. He couldn't quite see them, but he could almost reach out and touch them. Therefore, he left a little food for them. They were hungry. He tried to be nice to them because they had a bit of vengeance in their natures, among other things. These gods were very near, very real, and might even, under mysterious circumstances and dreams and trances, or in any unknown happening, might appear to manifest in proper person. Gradually, the gods began to move away. They became more and more remote, less and less physical, and at the same time as they drew further away, the area of their omniscience enlarged. Uh, the original god uh, nearby could only perhaps understand the doings of a family by listening at the keyhole, so to say. He had his little shrine in the house and people talked to him. And that's how he found out things. And even today among primitive people, it is not uncommon to have them punish deities or saints or other persons who do not appear to be taking proper care of the family. Down here in New Mexico at the present time, in, this, in the little downtown villages, you will frequently find an image of St. Joseph in a niche in the wall has been turned with his face to the wall as punishment for failing to perform his proper duties in the household. This is a very near, but it is also a very primitive belief. But little by little, the gods moved away. But as they moved away, they became greater beings. They became vastly more important. And in the case of, uh, of the Greeks, they moved to the mysterious, shadowy mountain peak of Olympus. And yet there were people in Greece, even in, the, in those days, that had climbed Olympus and knew there wasn't anybody on top. So you have another dimension coming in here. The gods not only dwelt there, but they dwelt in some invisible dimension. They were not just uh, physical beings. They were beings that had greater powers, greater extensions of consciousness and understanding. Then, after a long period of time, these gods that had moved so very, very far away uh, began to move closer again. And ultimately, 
all religions came to the same conclusion, namely that the divine power uh, upon which man must depend for his survival is not under the hearthstone or in the ancestral grave, nor is it in the far and distant reaches of the sky on some Olympian height. This God is in ourselves, and in every people this concept gradually turned and moved back again into man. Such a panorama is interesting and fascinating and well within the field of anthropology because that is where the rise of the God concept in nature has its strongest research programs. However, we must go back to our main theme now, namely that man was created by some kind of spiritual being. That man was the progeny of gods or the production of powers superior to himself of some kind. The Greeks, being essentially naturalistic, were not, however, completely willing to assume that man was begotten by a particular and special act of deity. This was not originally their concept. Their concept, rather, was that there was a spiritual creation of man. That humanity began, not as we know it, in the cell, or in the swamp, or in the elos, that man actually began as a splendid being in heaven. Among the mysteries of the Greeks, when they reached philosophic maturity, there was a very interesting speculation introduced that perhaps we should not forget. Namely, the reason why the gods are no longer on the top of Mount Olympus is because man is the gods. Now this is an interesting thought, but you'll have to ponder it a little bit. Namely, that the great order of life moving into manifestation was not only created by the gods, but was the motion of the divine power itself into manifestation. Therefore, that the gods moved into their own creation, became immersed in it, and absorbed in it, and that somewhere in the background of things, the great splendid world of the gods sank into the darkness and mystery of matter, and in this way resulted finally in the emergence of life, as seed everywhere because of the divine presence in matter, that this divine presence made all parts of matter full of life and capable of infinite growth from its own total substance. Dating all this, impossible. But theoretically thinking about these problems, we then have the second consideration, namely that something like the story of Deucalion and Pyrrha, namely that stones were thrown over their shoulders and that these stones became men and women. This is the second Greek concept of creation. The first creation was swept away by the deluge. And some of the old poets suspected that this deluge meant, in reality, the descent of the gods into the darkness of generation. That this is the great Ragnarok of the Nordic sagas, where Asgard and the great throne and the palace of Valhalla, all in flames and in combustion, fall into abyss together at the dawn of human existence, carrying the aces, the gods, into oblivion. That all that survived was a new world and a new peace and two human beings to carry on the mystery of creation. So these legends are archetypal. They have some meaning. We know that. We know they are too splendid, too deep, too broad, and in the case of most of them, too strangely and deeply pathetic to have no meaning. They meant something. 
and uh, part of the neglected field of our era of our era of our area is to try to find out what they meant if we have two creations we can also go back to the Dionysiac legend where the Titans or the primordial elements of nature um, manage to inveigle Dionysus the young god to follow them out into the sea of, and field of space and when he was far from his divine home they sat upon him destroyed him, cooked his flesh, and ate him. But in the process of eating him, his head was saved by Minerva or Athena and taken back to Zeus. Zeus, discovering what had happened, threw his thunderbolts at the primordial giants, slew them, and from their ashes, containing the blood of his own divine son, he fashioned the bodies of men. Now this also is a very stimulating series of thoughts. For it also tells us that in some mysterious way ancient man believed the human being to be a compound of the ashes of the titans and the life blood of a god. And while we might say this was primitive egotism, we're not at all sure of it. We are more inclined to suspect that the same meanings that were later developed into great philosophical beauty by Plato are to be found in their simplest statements in these myths. Actually then, the ancient people told us that what we call the creation of man resulted in the combination of two circumstances, one of which is traceable anthropologically and the other is not. The only other way it can be traced is by means of your great religious cycles of myths. And that these religious cycles uh, were not outgrown, but were deeply and carefully considered, and from them elaborate structures of rational projection were fashioned about man. And these have never been disproved although most of them have been broadly ignored, particularly within the last century. Of course, all of these structures were of much greater import prior to the rise of the Darwinian hypothesis. But now, to go on from this point, man created or brought into existence represents, therefore, a twofold motion of life. The positive motion of this life is from a divine source called by the ancient Chaldeans the father fountains of the gods. From therefore the divine nature there descend, descended the divine man. This divine man was truly and completely archetypal. Psychologically we are not too sure of what is implied. We cannot be certain, but the tone, the general tone of this ancient thinking is that this divine man was the true anthropos, the true being, and that this being had walked with God, that this being had an existence in a divine world or a divine state. The ancients are not clear as to whether this divine state had been eternal or had risen from some previous state. But the general assumption actually is that divine powers, either created or generated, or if we wish to uh, go still further into this thinking, that these powers preserved in their own natures from previous unknown sources this essential being that is called man. Consequently, that man actually is the son of God. Not in the personal sense of an individual, but in the collective sense 
For it is also specifically stated in the generation of man in several systems that in the creation, formation, or integration of this being, each of the principal deities contributed some essential characteristic or quality, as for example Athena, who bestowed the potential of wisdom, and Mercury, who bestowed the potential of learning or of knowledge. And each one of these deities bestowed from its own nature a quality. This immediately tells us something if we want to think about it for a moment, namely that the deities themselves are the personifications of qualities. Otherwise they could not bestow them. That we are not dealing with persons, we are dealing with conditioned energies. And that these conditioned energies united, bestowing each its own quality upon the production of the anthropos, or a being in which these qualities were therefore all latently present. This does not deny, however, that this being or this creature had great and enduring need for certain extensions of itself. In all systems, life, in order to manifest in any situation or condition, must adapt itself to form. Every life must be in form and end formed. In order to exist in any environment or condition, a being must have an instrument, a body or a nature, composed of the substances of that environment or condition. Otherwise it may be present, but it will be unseen and unknown if we wish to presume that it is present. This is true not only of the human being, but of the beings that very likely and most certainly do inhabit other planets, other solar systems, other cosmic systems. Whatever life comes in a manifestation must clothe itself in the substances of its environment, and by so doing make a bridge between its own subjective and the sphere in which it wishes to or needs to function. The ancients had a simple example of this and they made use of it. We know that the Indian people undoubtedly developed a large part of their great cosmological theory from embryology. From the actual study of the birth of the human being now, they believed they had a key to the great cyclic processes by which universal generation is achieved. This has also been obvious, noted, in many other systems of mythological thinking, as in Frazier's Golden Bough, where you will find many references to these parallel groups of legends. If, therefore, in the primordial nature of things, we are to have a being uh, coming or entering into a state of form, we must also have form itself gradually moving. Everything moves. And the development of life <coughs> implies the production of forms. In the great prehistoric uh, Phoenician history, uh, we have a record of this particular phase of the subject. Namely, that we have opposed or at least polarized to the great power of the divine beings who fashion the inward parts of things. We have another being that the ancients called nature. Now nature to them uh, was a little different from what we hold the word to mean today. Nature was a little more geological in their thinking than in ours. To us, nature is a rather beautiful panorama of sunrises, sunsets, and daisy fields. That was not the way the ancient thought of it. Always ensouling everything, making everything to live, which is part of his ancient way. To him, nature was also a being. And if God was the father of all things, nature was the mother of all things. And everything that exists is a child of God and nature. <coughs> 
a child of the primordial father-mother. Now nature was constructing continuously strange and beautiful and wonderful shapes and devisements. Nature, therefore, was spontaneously generating forms. Nature was hard at work with this monocellular organism coming out of the primordial ooze. Nature is full of life of itself. This life is not different from the life of God. It is merely an aspect of it. It is merely the opposite pole. It is the obscured or privated life of deity, according to the ancient legends. And therefore nature was producing forms uh, in which was a degree of life. This degree of life, as Sankraniathon points out, however, was a comparatively humble degree of life. A life uh, that might correspond with the prenatal growth of the human being, in which nature itself, as in the womb of Miru in the Indic myths, is generating a form which at some time is to be quickened or to be made alive. Thus, the embryo was made in nature. The life was made by the gods, and these two coming together represented the quickening, or the union of these parts, so that by the breathing of the breath of life into the dust of the earth, God fashioned man. Now the more we think about it, the more we can get scientific on this theme, because it opens a tremendous vista of possibilities by which a great many concepts otherwise meaningless can be reconciled and ordered. The only thing necessary to give validity to this concept is something that is causing considerable stress and strain in modern education, namely the possibility of assuming that the ages have been in some measure right and that man is a living soul. This is the great bugaboo. This is the great unsolved mystery. <coughs> if man is to be regarded as solely and totally the product of Mother Nature, with no help from a Divine Father, then uh, we cannot follow this hypothesis successfully. But when we block it, we block so many things that perhaps it will pay us to pause and see whether the exclusion of what might be termed the religious solution actually helps us any, or whether it does not make the entire procedure less meaningful, less purposeful, and less understandable. And always assuming that nature's ways are orderly, and that nature's ways are purposed, we have to begin to speculate as to what this order is and what these purposes might be. In any event, the greatest thinkers of all time, those to whom we are indebted for the greatest amount of knowledge that we possess, and for the foundations of every art and science that we now regard as essential to education and learning, these leaders, these pioneers of life, all agreed in the simple belief and conviction that man did have a soul. That this soul, or psychic nature, actually was not identical with his body, nor was it a byproduct of body, and that there is nothing essentially unreasonable in the conception that a quickening did take place, and that at some extremely remote period this quickening brought together a condition or circumstance which accounts for what we call the beginning of the culture impulse, the culture instinct. It is quite possible, as the ancients pointed out, that the form of man reached a comparative state of maturity before this culture instinct 
set in upon him and began to change him. So let us now go around again because we have to come back this road several times in different ways to get to our ultimate objective. And let us go now to consider for a moment this cultural problem. This problem upon which so much hangs and which has been so generally neglected as to its origin. What is the difference, for instance, in the state of man immediately before and after the advent of culture? It is assumed that man, having gained a certain differentiation uh, from other animals or from other creatures, physically speaking, was confronted by a series of circumstances which had to be assailed and conquered before man could attain the level of culture. Some of these circumstances are entirely reminiscent of the present animal state in nature. That the beginning of it all was that man, physically speaking, must survive. That survival, the will to live, the expression of a gradually increasing ingenuity, in the process of preserving his own survival, when, this, when analyzed, considered, and subjected to the modification of a billion and a half years, accounts for the gradual rise of man. Actually, in the animal kingdom, the need for survival is obvious. And animal life is largely divided between two problems of survival. Individual survival through food and collective survival through generation. These two become the principal purposes. Nature has in many instances indicated that of these two purposes food is the servant of generation. In other words there are many forms of life that having reproduced then perish. It being obvious that their continuance by the maintenance of food alone is not the primary purpose, the primary purpose of nature. That in these ancient patterns the purpose of nature was to ensure perpetuation and that from that time on the fate of the individual creature was far less meaningful. In the beginning then we have the animal man, or the animal type of man, distinguished by what has been called his parasite existence. It's coming back a little, but we hope we'll get over it. Namely, that man lived from nature without essentially contributing anything to nature. That man uh, also lived merely by the continuous search for food. Therefore, by the continuous use of the available supplies of nature. This situation, going along, became an almost constant demand upon the primordial life of man. His existence was non-cultural, simply because at that stage, existence and survival became so intimately associated. So at the first platform of our thinking, man's culture was blocked by survival. He had to consider only continuance and to make in innumerable and continuous adjustments to the challenge of destruction which hung constantly over him. The second period, which has been considered to be the next prenatal step in the birth of man as a culture being, was that which brought him to the beginning of his awareness of the possibility of attaining a certain partnership or a certain control, as it is called, over nature. This control is exemplified by ingenuity beginning to rise as a means of challenging the fatality of nature. It may have started with 
almost anything we can imagine, perhaps a rock in a man's hand. He found that he could throw a rock and achieve certain ends more easily than trying to fight the animal with his bare hands. He then learned uh, to put a handle on the rock and made a rough stone axe out of it. In the course of this, he also uh, discovered other things. Somewhere, that magnificent Promethean moment when he discovered fire. When he also discovered, as Diogenes tells us later, that a cup can be more convenient than your hand when you want a drink of water. That by degrees, man began to surround himself with the primitive necessity luxuries which began to indicate the rise of his own basic pattern for survival. But he's still struggling to survive now a little more successfully. Undoubtedly, he was nomadic to a degree. Those who could not be nomadic had to adjust themselves to the seasonal world in which they lived, and some of these adjustments were pretty strenuous. In fact, many did not survive at all. Then comes the next important step. Man beginning to cultivate nature, to gain control. And one of the simplest and easiest ways he accomplished this was by learning agriculture. And the oldest gods of the Greeks were venerated and honored because they brought the agricultural mystery to man. The domestication of animals and the rise of agriculture made possible, gradually, the integrated living in a community. It was no longer necessary to wander to find new food supplies. It was possible to produce food where you wanted it, and not necessarily always when you wanted it, but in sufficient abundance so that parts of it could be stored against seasonal change and condition. Man began to uh, gain a certain victory. In the course of this victory, he reached a point which we may call safety. <coughs> safety is always a relative thing. Safety meant more surviving than were lost. It did not mean total survival. Safety meant one thing, however, a break in the continuous demand of survival. It meant the possibility of the individual having available to him an increasing amount of leisure. His wants were few, his needs were not too many, but as soon as it became possible for him to make use of control of nature, he began to develop what might be termed leisure. Leisure or freedom from the challenge of continual survival permitted man to turn upon himself, not in the sense of war primarily, <coughs> although this was one of the pro byproducts of undisciplined and unenlightened leisure but rather turned upon himself to be able to sit still, to be quiet, to contemplate, to take his eye from the utter immediate and consider that which was somewhat more remote. Gradually out of the sense of leisure, out of the possibility of man having time to do something beside eat, propagate, and die, we see the beginnings of culture made possible to us. Now this period we now reconstruct in this way. But there is another possible interpretation of this reconstruction procedure. Following a little bit of what we have, obviously fulfilling it. But what we are really telling in this story of man's gradual victory over the prehistoric problem of survival is that man was constantly growing in some way. He was growing in resourcefulness. He was growing in skill. Perhaps he was growing in strength. More likely he was growing in control, which is the thing that makes 
it possible with less strength to accomplish more. <coughs> Thus we finally have the story of a being growing up to a state of self-identity, growing up to a state which is the first peculiar evidence of humanity, and that is thoughtfulness. Up to this time, we can find man differing in some ways from the creatures around him, but with no certainty of victory over them, and no probability of a destiny apart from them. Suddenly, well, I say suddenly because it appears so in our frame of reference, but probably not in time so rapidly. Man differentiated from all other forms of life around him. He suddenly began to assume a uniqueness. And this uniqueness was only possible when a certain degree of personal integration had been attained. The Greeks and other ancient peoples, uh, working upon their mythological platforms, came to the conclusion that this growing up of bodies through the animal state finally resulted in the creation of a being in whose organism and integration the release of what might be termed an extra faculty was possible. This release of an extra faculty was not its dawn, was not its beginning in man, but according to these ancient peoples, it was at this time that the quickening took place, and that which had previously been a free soul became identified with this growing form, because this form had now reached a degree of growth in which the function of this being began to be possible. Certain centers of nervous structure, certain refinements in brain and in the various fields of the human sensitivity made it possible for something to take hold of this form, to possess it, to move in upon it, to absorb it, and to begin to operate upon it from within moving gradually and inevitably towards final conquest of this form. This would be perfectly in line with uh, some of the basic thinking that we have, namely that what we might term evolution or cultural growth is therefore being controlling its own instrument, and that what we see around us as cultural progress is merely a byproduct, an inevitable consequence of a pattern of self-conquest occurring within the being. That civilization, therefore, is nothing more or less than a degree of progress attained in the essential psychic compound of man. That these and soul beings gradually then moved by degrees over a long period of time through the processes of increasing control of these instruments which they possessed. This control affected slowly and inevitably every department of human function. The nearest parallel that we have to it in the visible natural progress of man is the process of childhood the process of growing up after birth. We have here the clear and certain indication of consciousness, if we wish to so call it, gradually emerging from inadequate physical structure, and that the growth of the structure is important only that it leads or results in the growth or release of the consciousness within that structure. Thus, the growing child is the one who is gaining control of its body and is gradually transforming this body from a prison 
into a skillful instrument of its own purpose. This is one explanation for what we term the cultural program for man. That at the transitional stage, man ceased to be like other animals around him simply because he was ensouled by a being with greater potential. And that this ensoulment resulted in the purposes of the body being gradually modified to result in their final acceptance of the purposes of the being in the body. Thus this new perspective gave man the incentive, gave man the dynamic by which he went forth to become a builder of cities, by which all the things that are related of him in the ancient works were made possible. And that what we now term evolution is the slow and gradual revelation of that which is inevitably the self, inevitably the anthropos, and that anthropology is therefore the study of the anthropos. And the anthropos, as the Egyptian gnosis tells us, was not the visible man, but the being above the man. Thus, in the uh, Gnostic system of Valentinus, the being is called Anthropos, and the body is called Anthropos, the son of Anthropos, a peculiar term with which scholars have been working for ages, trying to find out what was meant. Therefore, that the being is the, is the man, and the body is that man which is the son of the man, or the extension of him into manifestation. And that therefore we have perhaps an understanding of the rise of a great anthropomorphism in human experience. That is the struggle of light and darkness, the struggle of good and evil, the struggle of life and death. For this struggle was more or less archetypally the struggle of the being against the stasis of the body. That the fall of man symbolically is the descent of the man into the body. Uh, to be captured, as Plato says, uh, like the oyster within its shell. Therefore, that what we call evolution is divisible into two great parts. That which is called nature, which is forever the molder of forms, the creator of bodies, and that which is called man, who is eternally the inhabitant of these instruments or vessels which have been fashioned uh, for his need. That this was purposed, that the gods of the Olympian heights decreed it to be this way, that life is a constant ascending of forms, being met by the descending of life, and wherever these two meet, there is a living soul. That this living soul is not generated simply from the experience of contact in nature, but is the result of the union of two elements or two principles to form a compound. This again is consistent with the Pythagorean and Gnostic philosophies. For we are informed by these systems that there are three states in nature, spirit, matter, and form. Form is a compound. Form is a body which must be composed of material elements and archetypal energies. The reason why matter becomes formal is because it comes under the laws and rules of a pattern or archetype and that this archetype bestows mathematical or geometrical harmony upon matter, raising matter into organization, and that such organization as is resulting from these two factors uh, may be regarded as the proper definition of the ensouled man. 
Now we may say, what have we actually done on the level of our anthropological researches? We have not changed the fact that out of the amoeba, out of the clod, out of the marsh and the maya, there crawls something forth upon the earth. But we may question whether that thing which crawled forth upon the earth was actually the beginning of the total man. We may question whether this being, left entirely to its own devices, could ever have been anything than a super animal. That it rose with others of its kind. That it developed with others of its kind. And as in the case of the embryo before birth, up to a certain point the human embryo cannot be differentiated from the embryo of a chicken or a horse. But as a certain point is reached, then the one indicates gradually and inevitably that it is going to be a chicken. The other remains, continues to unfold, and finally becomes a human being. But at a certain state, they are indistinguishable. There is no way of telling one from the other, except that one grows more before it is born. And the one that grows more is man. Thus, in the face of nature, there is no way in which we could distinguish or no certain method by which we could indicate a point in the remoteness of things where man and the animal could be clearly differentiated. This would follow again the most ancient thinking we have, namely that in that time there was no obvious difference but that this difference appeared in due time, appeared when life reached the point of sustaining this difference. And that at that time, this difference became manifested, and man suddenly became a creature with a purpose. A creature with a reason for existence other than biological. And that biology did not cease because the continuance of forms for embodiment continued to be necessary. That the search for food did not cease because this body which was to be the house of a soul had to be maintained and sustained or the soul was homeless. However, life divided now into two purposes. One, to be regarded as the maintenance of the house. And the other, the increasing freedom of the householder. The being that lived in the house. This immediately divided the life of man into two purposes. Psychologically, these purposes are everywhere obvious. Man is not a united creature in his purposes. He is purposed by two contrary forces. And the conflict between these contrary forces is one of the principal reasons for nearly all the problems that arise in human life. The survival from a bodily standpoint is also sustained by something that we call instinct. Now, instinct is something we do not know too much about. It's one of those delightful things that we should know a lot about, and because we need to know, we cannot find out. But instinct seems to tell us, or our own study of instinct, that in this part of our nature, we have the survival of what has been called the pre-Adamite man. That is, the pre and sold man. That instinct was the power that governed before the quickening. That instinct, therefore, was a life out of nature, a kind of nature spirit that rose out of the earth and was that part of man's structure that did respond unhesitatingly and continuously to the demands of survival that what we commonly believe to be instinct today 
is therefore the survival of a primordial pressure. And that instinct, after it has gone to school and gotten a diploma, instinct becomes sophisticated or cultivated to the degree that it may seem to be a legitimate force that has inherited the real right of ruling the body. Instinct, now not fully recognized in itself, can therefore be the cause of the most excessive positive and negative reactions of our emotional life, our vital life, and certain rudimentary elements of our mental lives. Thus body left to itself follows instinct. Body and soul follows the soul. The instinct nature of man has slowly become considered under a broad general title, the lower man. Now the lower man is a most agreeable fellow. The lower man is constantly impressing upon us the sovereign importance of doing what we please. The divine man is constantly impressing upon us the sovereign importance of doing that which is right, or that which is necessary, or that which is next. Each of these forces is seeking the gratification of itself, seeking also the fulfillment of its own purposes. Instinct has no over-purpose, because the primary, primary creature seeking to eat ate and was hungry again because it ate only the food of nature. But the soul man sought another food that those who ate thereof should not again hunger. And this difference has carried on. It almost would seem, although this may be an exaggeration and I wouldn't want to be quoted for this, but to the press at least, it would almost seem that what we term materialism is instinct with a college education. <laughs> that materialism is essentially the aggrandizement of the man of instinct. On the assumption that this man, by piling mountain upon mountain, piling Osser upon Pelion, and piling them both upon Olympus, that he is going to reach heaven. That the instinct man is going to be able uh, to in some wonderful manner usurp the prerogatives of the soul man and thereby gain an immortality or a survival apart from soul. This was a great subject of drama, out of myth and of legend. But the pattern of it is so rather obvious in our daily living that it perhaps is worth a little careful consideration. That we have, as Gaeta says in Faust, two beings within us. One in the earth aspires, the other to heaven aspires. And these are the two men, Anthropos and Anthropos, the son of Anthropos. And it was by giving man this inward insight of the soul nature that the powers, personal or impersonal, universal or inevitable, however we wish to so calculate them or define them, having breathed into man the breath of life, made him master of his garden and gave him dominion over the creatures of the air and of the fields. Now, in giving him dominion, the ancients would say that first of all, they bestowed upon man potential dominion over himself. But that this dominion had to be earned. And that this earning was nothing more or less than integrated yearning. That it was yearning backed by purpose, backed by energy. So that these things which man instinctively longed to fulfill might be fulfilled. Culture has been defined as man's longing for truth. Longing for 
total internal maturity. And that this internal maturity is the result of a kind of second birth. That by the first birth, man was born out of the water and the mud. But by a second birth, the Son of Heaven was born in man. And having taken up its abode in man, becomes by natural right the proper ruler of man. Therefore, that man must be ruled by the psychic integration, or the self within the body. As a support of this concept, we also have the continuous evidence that man advances most, becomes most certainly secure, when he depends upon the superior phases of his consciousness for his protection and his survival. Man is no longer capable even of thinking of entering into a heavily competitive relationship with the inferior forms of life around him. He is no longer of them. He sees them no longer as like himself. Rather, he perceives that his survival, his security, rests in a battle within his own nature. Therefore, we have a new heaven and a new earth. That new heaven and the new earth, which for man become infinitely more important than the vast heaven and earth of which he is biologically and psychologically a part. That this new heaven is his own inward life, and his new earth is the world into which this life has been placed. That there is therefore the heaven in man and the earth which is the outer part of man. And the great processes, which we now call evolution, arise from not the pressure of incident and accident upon the outer life of man, but the pressure of an inner life to express itself through man. This pressure becomes, then, the irresistible and inevitable force that has driven man down through the ages, causing him to become ever more concerned with self-knowing and ever more concerned with not only adjustment to the world, which might presumably be even achieved by instinct, but of a reformation of the world, of a restoration of a better state, and the envisioning of a way of life superior to that which presently exists. These things arise not from experience because man has not known them. The world we look for is not a world that comes to us from our physical environment but rather is archetypal of a universal state which preceded our involvement in a material existence. Thus we can assume a parallel, the possibility that anthropology as we know it is not essentially in error, but rather that it is half of a story, and that the other half of the story takes part or takes place behind the line or the veil which divides the external life of man from his internal and eternal roots. Now our time is up, so that's the foundation for the first evening.